Well, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Psalm 139, uh, verses 1 through 10. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, Behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. I don't know if that's terrifying or comforting. It is intended to be comforting, but it is close, isn't it? That the Lord would have us, as the psalmist says, hemmed in. This is a psalm of David. Hemmed in, that he knows everything. Even before we think it, he knows what we're about to think. Um, but I think that is meant to give us great comfort that the sovereign God that means through all of the high times all of the low times he's there he knows you're there and he knows why you're there there's a purpose for it and that's a great comfort to us perhaps it's obvious why I've chosen that on a night that we look at Jonah um, let's let's pray Lord indeed you have uh, searched us and known us um, even before we were conceived you conceived of us first from time eternity you've known of us you knew that we would one day be one of your children it's a staggering thought it's no wonder that david was also the man who wrote who am i that you're mindful of me and yet tonight we rejoice in this we i do pray that this wouldn't uh, it would do more than uh, stagger us, and it certainly wouldn't scare us. We pray that it would thrill our hearts, that the God of all who is knows us so intimately. And in spite of all those things, perhaps we'd like to hide from you. You still love us. You still call us um, your children. And that we take great comfort in tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Tonight, Lord, as we come again to the book of Jonah, a book that is um, firstly about you, firstly about a big God, um, yet it is so at times achingly human, we see ourselves in it. We wonder, would we be like Jonah? Would, we, would, would words such as you gave him, would they rest easily upon our hearts or would we resist him as resist them as, as he did. How hard sometimes we do fight against you. We thank you that in those moments that uh, this, this hymn that we've just sung uh, are always true, that the words are always true, that you do indeed hold us fast. Thank you that our, our trust is not in ourselves, it's not in our own performance. It's not really even in our own faith, it's, it's in your faithfulness to us. And of course, as we look upon you, as we think upon your faithfulness, it does engender faith within us. As we look upon your power, we look upon your, your might, your sovereignty, that engenders in us not just a thankfulness, it engenders in us faith, it, it promotes faith within us. What a wonderful thing that we, you grant us faith to repent and believe. You grant us sustaining faith and you grant us culminating faith as well, that we will be those who endure till the end, that should you return during our lifetime, you will find not only faith on the earth, you'll find faith in our hearts. And for that, we owe you every thanks, eternal thanks. And we thank you in Christ's name, amen. So Jonah, I will read uh, Jonah 1 from verse 4 through 16. Uh, I'm in the English Standard Version, and this is God's Word. 
But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give you a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you've done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea, and the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Well, in my best uh, presenter voice, I'll say previously in Jonah, we witnessed a prophet saying no to God. I know, don't give up your day job, right? Um, but it, <laughs> just to remind us what we faced last week, we saw Jonah wondrously saying no to a very clear word of the Lord. Last week, and I reminded us of this this morning, that Jonah is not primarily about a big fish. It's not about a big storm, and it's not even about a, a big city, but it's about a big God. We didn't quite see evidence of that last week, did we? The first three verses, we see God giving a command to Jonah, arise, go to Nineveh, and Jonah says, no, no, I don't think I'm going to go to Nineveh. In fact, I want to go about in the exact opposite direction direction. Um, he goes down to the Mediterranean cruise and in terms of the known world goes about as far away as you can go from Nineveh and that would be to Tarshish at the very um, western edge basically of the Mediterranean. And the scene closes with Jonah paying his fare, going down into the ship and seemingly away from the presence of God. And so it begs the question, if you were to stop reading there, and it's hard to put down Jonah, isn't it? Um, but if you stop there, you'd wonder, can a man run from the presence of God? Can he actually run from the presence of God and the will of God and the purpose of God for one's life? These are good questions for us to ask. Well, in response to Jonah's running, what we see in the rest of chapter 1 is God pursuing God is pursuing, and he pursues in two ways. He pursues in power, and he pursues through circumstances. I don't, what I mean by through circumstances, there are those circumstances that present themselves as obstacles. So in a way, in spite of circumstances, he pursues us. And then sometimes even by circumstances, he uses circumstances in his pursuit of us. I think we see both of those things. Uh, in Jonah, and probably we've seen both of those things if we think about it in our lives. 
So firstly, God pursues us in power. Well, I've read most of the rest of chapter 1 until verse 16, and we certainly see God's power on display, don't we? <clears throat> we could ask ourselves, as Jonah, as we think about Jonah saying no to God, God Almighty, what did he think he was doing? Did he really think that he could flee from God's presence? I want to say I don't really think so. Um, he is a man of God, and next week we'll be in chapter 2. And in chapter 2, we hear Jonah's prayer. And we'll see that it's full of references to the Psalms. And so I find it highly unlikely that he wouldn't know this great Psalm of David that I read from, Psalm 139, which says, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? Surely he knew that. He knows he can't really flee from God's presence, but perhaps he can flee in some way geographically. Perhaps he can force God's hands by leaving. God surely then will choose somebody else to do this unsavory task. That task I don't want to do. He makes himself in a way unavailable so that God has no choice. Staying home, of course, wouldn't have worked because there are too many reminders of the Lord there. And so, yeah, it seems timely to take that Mediterranean cruise. Later in verse 9, the sailors ask him, and of course he says, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Quite revealing as well. Again, this is a man of God. He's got decent theology, doesn't he? He fears the Lord. He knows that God is the God of heaven and that he made the sea and the dry land. That's a good answer. But what he believed in his head, clearly he'd forgotten in his heart. But the Lord, we see, would not let him forget it. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. We don't see evidence. Like the narrator doesn't put it really through the mouth of Jonah, that Jonah believes in his heart what he confesses with his mouth about the Lord of all land and sea. But make no mistake, the truth of the claim is on full display as God causes a great storm to arise. That's very clear, isn't it? The, it is the Lord that hurled a great wind upon the sea. It's God that causes it. And this is a repeated theme through this little book. God on display as the one who initiates. He initiates, and that recurs time and again through the book. So, so look for that. Uh, several years ago now, uh, Linda and I were given a box set, a, a DVD box set, documentary series on nature. You all know it because it's done by the great local boy, Sir David Attenborough, right? Very gifted, and it's, it's captivating if you've seen it, and he's done several like series. And it really does put the remarkable beauty of creation on display. But perhaps what, what we found at least even more striking than that was that it, the complete absence of the acknowledgement of God as creator, sadly. And sustainer, not just creator. It's not just that he creates and then steps back from his creation. He's actively involved in his creation as sustainer. Well, chapter one sees God's power on full display and that brings us to one of the many surprises in the book of Jonah. The storm was so terrible that verse 5 tells us that these seasoned sailors were so afraid that each cried out to their own God. Now, you must imagine mariners here. Now, these, these aren't people that have come to this because they're running from God. They've chosen this as their profession. So imagine hardened mariners that are well accustomed that they're professional sailors and you know amongst those professional sailors there's got to be those that old two or three guys you know gus and bob 
who are saying, oh, you wimps. Gosh, you remember that storm from when was it? 752? Yeah, something like that. You haven't seen anything yet. You know there are guys that want to say that. And yet what the Bible says is that to a last man, they're crying out to God. This was no ordinary storm. They cried out to God. One theologian calls these SOS prayers. I don't think SOS was initially set up as a short form, but you could call them save our souls prayers. You know, those things that we do in emergency, foxhole prayers, perhaps we call them as well. The prayers of desperation to the various man imagined gods of their preference. We don't really know the nationality of these men. Some suggest they're Phoenicians, but at any rate, they would probably have a variety of gods that they're praying to, small g gods. And basically the thought is if, if mine's not real or not powerful enough or not preferential to me tonight, perhaps my mates will be. And so we cast out these SOS prayers. It reminds us of the first scene of Shakespeare's The Tempest. When the Mariners say, I don't know if he had Jonah on his mind, but Shakespeare wrote, all lost to prayers, to prayers all lost. It's what men do when they feel desperate, they pray. Well, these cumulative prayers to unknown gods have no effect. We see that. They have no effect. The, the storm rages on. So left now to their own devices, they turn to practical means. They hurl cargo in the ship overboard. We see this world word hurl uh, three times. So God hurls the wind and man tries to hurl back. It tries to volley back against the work of God. And obviously that also has no effect. God hurls the great wind upon the sea. They hopelessly try to hurl back. I love when that happens, actually, when we, man has a bit of a comeuppance. Um, you know, nature, uh, God can be so awesome. It can limit even the highest of our technologies. If you've flown, um, I've been watching too many of these series of late. I don't know why I do this, because I fly a lot. So I've been watching this thing whilst I build my kitchen cabinets. Uh, called air crash investigation. It tells me all of the ways that uh, aircraft come down. Um, anyway, it's going to test my faith the next time I fly. But uh, all of the instrumentation, all of the, the gadgetry that we put into airports, and yet a simple common storm can ground planes so easily. You know, it, it deals with the hubris of man. Well, such was their fear but also their regard for their own lives, these mariners now started to throw their livelihood overboard. Now that's desperate, isn't it? This was a cargo ship, evidently. It had a crew, but there was cargo on the ship, and it didn't say they threw the heaviest or the easiest or the lightest. Uh, it said they, the cargo. So presumably, all, if it wasn't fastened down, they threw it all overboard. They, again, they hurled it <laughs> overboard. That was not only their fear, but keep in mind the regard for their own lives as well. What we see from this is, in a way, both man-made religion doesn't provide an answer. Their prayers to their unknown gods, but their works was not an answer either, was it? The problem clearly is beyond them. And so in contrast, to this piety, we'll call it piety because these men are crying out to God in their desperation and their action. They put feet to their prayers, if you will. It's the way we would say it. These pagan sailors, even if it's misdirected, Jonah stands in stark contrast, doesn't he? He is found asleep in the belly of the boat until the captain wakes him up with these words. And the irony is so rich. Arise, call out to your God. Now, what in the world does Jonah hear when he hears that word, arise? He's asleep. He must be thinking, I'm having a nightmare. God is not letting me alone. 
And he rubs his eyes and, and then looks up, oh, it's this salty captain who's now threatening me. But the captain's using words he's heard before, arise, go to Nineveh, and now arise, call out to your God, ironically reminding Jonah of God's call and word to him. He must be thinking to himself, you've got to be kidding me. You've absolutely got to be kidding me. If only you knew how far I feel from the God you want me to cry out to. Well, this pagan captain also seems to have, though, some grasp on God's mercy. He's got actually pretty good theology as well, because he says, perhaps you're God. He doesn't presume upon God. If this is the God who is causing this tempest, perhaps he would have mercy on us. Interesting that this pagan captain doesn't want to make human prayers the center of attention. We were talking when we were looking at uh, the blessing of prayer, that there should always be from the Christian heart a contrition toward God, a humility toward God. That sense, even if we don't utter it, yet not my will, but yours be done. We are trying to align our prayers with God's will, right? And I think that's what we see from the captain as well, this pagan captain. He has a grasp on God's mercy for all nations and peoples when he says, perhaps your God will give a thought to us that we might not perish. Does Jonah, can Jonah tick that box right now in this part of the story? What do we make of Jonah sleeping? Well, on a practical level, I, I think it can be tied to his rebellion. There's this common expression that actually comes out of Isaiah 48, if you want to look it up. No rest for the wicked. No rest for the wicked. Um, you know, what's the answer to that guilty conscience that he is carrying around as such a burden? It's, of course, repentance. But perhaps you've also found that when you've got something weighing on your conscience, sometimes the only way you can escape from it is to curl up, pull the comforter over your head and hope to sleep, to separate yourself from the voice of God, from the urgent, uh, the urgent uh, you know, matter at hand. And perhaps that's what Jonah's facing. He, he's been running from God in, 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 in the scurrying of the moment, in the tension of the moment, He's finally found some rest because he's sleeping. You know, there are things God makes clear to us. It's, it's hard sometimes to, to know the, the will and intentions of God. Sometimes we have that sense of he's a lamp unto our feet, but that lamp really doesn't shine very far ahead, right? Um, and that can be unsettling to us. It's not always uh, easy, is it? But there are times, I think, when God makes things very clear to us, either because it's clear in his word or there's a very clear witness of his spirit with ours. Things that we ought to do or things that we ought not to do. And when our hearts and our thoughts and our energies are not aligned with that which is clear to us, we face thin and inner struggle, and it's tiring. I think Jonah's sleep mostly represents this spiritual state that he's in. He is a prophet, and indeed Israel as a nation were to declare God's glories to the world and be a light to the nations. We know that. The sailors are crying out to non-existent gods, while this guy who knows the real God, who knows Yahweh, is asleep in the belly of the ship. And so, in a way, he's been rendered useless by his own disobedience. But what we see beyond that, by even the simple fact that God is hurling this great wind and this storm to arrest Jonah, surely we also see that God is moving heaven and earth to get to him. He's moving heaven and earth to get to Jonah, to, to get that attention. Now, you may feel that your life hasn't been nearly so dramatic as Jonah's story, but there are times when God has moved heaven and earth to get your attention. It may not seem like it, but you know, I was talking to someone recently about that sense that we have that when we come to Christ, we made a decision. We, 
we accepted something that was presented to us and, and we clearly exercised our will and said yes to God. And it can feel like something that, in a way, we've almost orchestrated ourselves. And then after the fact, as you grow in God, as you read his word and you understand his ways, and maybe you start to meet older aunts at a funeral that say, oh, you know, I used to pray for you. In fact, I've been praying for you daily. There were people in our lives, dear people in our lives that prayed for us every day. I, I, I literally at funerals, I would meet sisters of my mom that I found out were, were Christians and attending church regularly. And I caused me to wonder who was perhaps involved in my story that I had no idea of. How was God moving upon the hearts of others? Not just to witness to me directly, but even just simply to pray for old Gary. Um, God in some way has moved heaven and earth to make himself real to you. Well, secondly, we see that not only does he pursue with power or in his power, he uses the power at his disposal to pursue. He's pursuing Jonah, he pursues us. God also pursues through circumstances. Look at verse seven. It's interesting how this is presented in the story. They said to one another, come and cast, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they, they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So at this point in the story, we've had the captain uh, arouse our sleeper and, and apparently they either come up, a, you know, up from the, the belly of the ship or somehow they come across the crew and they find the crew uh, continuing in their attempts to solve what they know now this this has got to be a religious problem we've we've hurled <laughs> we've hurled everything at this problem that we can our, our prayers to our unknown gods we've we've cast off the ballast from the ship um, and yet still we're about to sink and so they're trying to solve it and they, they turn to lots and they, they feel surely the guilty party the one to whom they owe their situation is amongst them and they trust the lots to tell the truth. And this isn't actually just a pagan practice. We can see it actually in scripture. Um, make note of this if, you, if these aren't uh, obvious examples to you, but when Jonathan violated uh, Saul's um, uh, oath in the campaign against the Philistines, uh, we see them casting lots. This is in 1 Samuel 14. Uh, it was a sacred lot that, that found out the work of Jonathan. Uh, Joshua 18 speaks of it. When Joshua is apportioning out land, there's a casting of lots and 1 Chronicles 24. But interestingly, what Proverbs inter how Proverbs interprets that, Proverbs 16.33 tells us that the lot is cast into the, into the lap, but it is every decision, but it's every decision is from the Lord. And so what appears to be something of, of uh, is, is this introducing a randomness uh, to circumstances? No, God is behind even the casting of lots. The lot that is cast into the lap renders a decision, but that decision is from the Lord. That's Proverbs 16.33. Jonah is now awake, awake, as I said, and the lot falls to him. And so now it's interesting that the captain and the, the sailors pepper him with all these desperate questions. He's already told them that he was running, evidently, that's what the text says, from God. But now they are living with the consequences of his running. And they want to know, who are you? Where are you from? From what people are you? And they ask in exasperation almost, like, what is this that you've done? I, I think in the common vernacular, we'd say, how could you be so stupid, right? Surely that's what's on their mind because they've been impacted from this. This spiritual slumber has that effect on us as well. Sometimes others, even non-Christians, can see things that we miss in our own blindness. And of course, there's more irony here. Um, there's more irony here, isn't there? Because through those questions, Jonah is now forced to give testimony to pagans, which is the very thing he's resisting to do. Do you see how God has his way, he has his will, 
it will not be thwarted. In short, it's, it's just foolish to run from the God who happens to also run the world. Jonah says no to God. He turns away from him, yet God pursues. Uh, we see a couple of remarkable things through this part of the story. We see, one, a glimpse into the prophetic office, but two, we also see a glimpse into you know, the, the, uh, God's sovereign will and purposes. In, in the sense of a glimpse into the prophetic office, I just mean we see you know, the prophet was a human. Jonah was a man of God, yes, but he's not a superman. He's a man of God, but a human man of God. And we see his wrestlings with God's will. And to a point, we see that God's divine spirit can be resisted. He says no. And so we are watching this from the outside in as the reader. The, the prophet, like us all, I think, being a living soul with mind, will, emotions, not a mere machine, as if God can you know, put some data card in and out comes his purposes. He resists God. Perhaps all of us can relate to that in some way. And in a way, the prophet must consent to bear the responsibility that the Lord elects for him. And I think the same can be said for every one of us, even, I mean, none of us are Old Testament prophets clearly this evening. But each of us consents in some way to the message and the gifts and the callings that God has entrusted to us. Each of us must yield such that his grace to us would not prove to be in vain. To the point we say, like Isaiah, here am I, Lord, send me. That's what we need to get to. Now, I know the, this, this is, you know, we could spend probably 52 weeks discussing this and, and pouring through scriptures. It's, it's a challenging topic, you know, providence and prayer and our will and the sovereign will of God. What do we know? from scripture. We know that God works all things according to the counsel of his will. All things. Even the death of Christ, we know, was in a sense ordered, designed by God, and yet the perpetrators had the blood on their hands as well. So there's this fusion of human responsibility and yet divine will that is just difficult to understand. It is just difficult to understand. So that's our perspective, that looking at a man struggling under the weight of the burden he feels by God's calling. But then the other side of the coin is the providence of God, of God's sovereign will. We know that can't be thwarted. As I said, he works all things according to the counsel of his own will. We know that. And so in spite of circumstances, even by circumstances, we see God at work don't we? Jonah runs, true, but God follows, also true. The lot falls to Jonah. He fesses up to a point, but it's not surely true repentance. We know that. He does admit, that's what I've done, but true repentance would be to say, okay, where's the next ship that's going in the opposite direction? And he doesn't do that. He doesn't do an about face. He actually says, throw me overboard. Now that's another interesting content, uh, contrast, isn't it, with the pagan sailors. The pagan sailors who valued the life that, that an unknown God had given them to the point where they would cast off their livelihood, doing all they could to save their own lives. And jo Jonah won't do the one thing he, al he absolutely knows that he must do if he wishes to save his life. And he can't get himself to do it. He's so opposed to to fulfilling what God wants him to do, that he's willing to throw himself overboard sacrificially. God's not asking him to do that. He's asking him, I think, to repent. He's thrown overboard. Uh, and again, yeah, the contrast with the, the pagan sailors. Jonah knows he's the problem. <coughs> but almost comically, he says, pick me up and hurl me into the sea again. We see 
this hurling going on, the same word over and over again. Again, again, pointing out the futility of man's works and efforts to thwart God's will. It's not a fair fight. It is not a fair fight. God's will will not be thwarted, never be thwarted. And circumstances take yet another turn. We don't yet see the the resolution because I didn't read all the way to the end. I didn't read verse 17. But we know what happens next. There is another turn in God's providence according to his will and something that's going to further arrest Jonah. And we'll read about that next week, uh, taking verse 17 forward. We do see the hand of God. To be clear, God is not merely caring to bring about his plans and purposes. He also cares about Jonah, doesn't he? That's really, really encouraging for us tonight. That one who is running, that one who is resisting, that one who is willing even to forsake his life, to not do God's will. Sometimes we talk about the greater David, the greater Moses. Well, who is the greater Jonah? But Jesus, the one who went willingly up to his sacrifice, obedient even to the point of death. He is the greater Jonah. But God does care for Jonah. It's not just his plans and purposes. Jonah probably could have had a plan. I mean, God could have had a plan B or C or D. And I guess sometimes that does happen when people turn away. It's part of God's in a way, part of his plans and provision, that he knows this one will say no, will walk away from a, from a purpose, and somebody else will pick it up. But in this case, he's going to the end. We're, he's seeing it through with Jonah. So we see the unfolding of God's plan, but we also see that Jonah is not free from God's presence. He's not free from God's power, and he's not free from God's preserving mercy. And so I guess as we close tonight, uh, the question really is, do we trust the hand of God? Do we trust the hand of God? Do we trust the hand of God in spite of and even through circumstances, circumstances that try us, that challenge us? Sometimes we have to see circumstances as obstacles and that God is going to take them, take us through them. Other times we have to embrace circumstances that are challenging to know that this is part of his remaking of us into his image. He uses both of these things. So if you're running today in a big way or a small way, this word is like, I think, Jonah's storm in a way. It's a mercy, perhaps, of God helping to put an anchor down in your life on your waywardness. And so please, please don't ignore it. Please Take consideration of little ways and big ways that you are resisting God and take encouragement that he will indeed never leave you nor forsake you. That he cares about you. I don't want to say even more than his plans and purposes, because I think in God that's just hard to to disentangle those things, because all of these things work to his glory. But to say that in some way he's some dis... um, a disenfranchised or disconnected from your pain or your suffering or your well-being is just simply not our God. He does care for you in and through everything. Uh, Let's pray. Lord, as we... uh, continue on in this this great little book. Um, we do thank you that, I, I thank you, that it is uh, um, so obvious how wonderful you are and how big you are. You are indeed a big God. You're bigger even than our rebellious nature. You're bigger than our will. Uh, you're stronger than our will. You're more persistent than our will. Thank you that not a single one that you've been given will you let go of. And we, we hold fast to that. We've just sung, you will hold us fast. That is indeed true. Truer words are never spoken. You will indeed hold us fast. You are faithful to thee and the author and the finisher of our faith. Help us, though, to grow in, in our yielding to you that 
we would find our greatest, greatest pleasure, our highest pleasure in serving your highest purposes. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Um, you know, I hate time. Um, <laughs> I do hate it sometimes. But um, at some point, I do want to address um, the, the beginnings that we see here of the, the keynote verse that I, I said was in this to, to sort of unlock the book is 2.9, that salvation belongs to the Lord. And, and we do see this. I haven't even touched it tonight. But, but the, what I see as the salvation of these pagan sailors. So I'll, I'll have to address that at some point in the rest of the series. It's, it's, it's beautiful, isn't it? Uh, I, I, there's not really any doubt in my mind what verse 16 tells us, that they feared. Like these were sailors that were fearing fearing the tempest, now they fear the Lord of the tempest. Isn't that wonderful? Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, that's one of my favorite parts of this benediction, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. It's his great joy. Uh, go in his peace, you are loved. Thank you.